good to welcome back Russ and Pat Steiner. We've been doing interim work in Cambridge. How long has it been, Russ? Been two or three years? So, well, three years, that's what I thought. Wow. She got them all straightened out, so good job. Pat, nice to see you here today. Nice to see each one of you here today. Nice to have you worshiping with us this day. I'm sure you're familiar with the verse that uh, reads, money is the root of all evil. If you are familiar with it, you recognize that I misquoted it. What's it say? Okay. The love of money in the NIV translation says the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Thank you very much for that. The King James Version which some of us learned before the NIV came around, Todd, says the love of money is the root of all evil. Now, whichever is preferable, it's obvious that the negative effect of money upon many humans, even many Christians, is undeniable. And it is astonishing. It's very difficult when money is involved to remain completely objective, even among Christians and even among family. Christians are not immune from this. Business is business, meaning we do things at business we do not do at church. That's evil thinking. But that's the world. That's the way the world does it. Oh, well, that's just business. That's how we treat people in business. At church, we do it differently. No. That's part of the evil thinking. The lure of money and what it brings, what it offers, what it promises is extremely powerful, evil, and even potentially demonic. Last week we studied, we saw the great prostitute, the false religious system of the world, the false religious church. We saw her fall. The beast finally had uh, had enough and turned on her. Well, that same spirit that originated at Babylon prostituted not only the church and religion, but that same spirit also controls Wall Street, Pennsylvania Avenue, and South Plymouth Avenue today. The Bible calls it the world. The world is the economic and political system that operates outside the jurisdiction of God. Not outside the jurisdiction of God as such. It just thinks it does. It simply ignores God denies the existence of God, even blasphemes God. That's the world. As a young believer, once I got excited about the Lord, it amazed me to watch the evening news, to listen to the radio, to walk down Main Street and hear nothing about God. When he was so real and so uh, amazing to me, and those songs we just sang were so extremely powerful. I hope they touched you. You know, and I hope they reached and touched God with your worship because he is awesome. He is amazing. He is beyond, beyond description. And to think that the world pushes him aside and goes on with its life is amazing. And now it might seem natural to you. It might seem natural. After all, what does God have to do with business? What does he have to do with education, government, or anything, or any other institutions? After all, isn't there a separation of church and state? There may be a separation of church and state, but never should a Christian separate his relationship with God or, or, or leave God at the door and go in and say, well, that's just business, or that's the way I do politics. But that's what the world wants God to left out there completely. This system that denies God is going to become progressively more and more belligerent until the beast finally steps up and says the, the ultimate end of it is when he starts saying, hey, you cannot buy or sell unless you have my permission, unless you have my number. And furthermore, furthermore, it would even be a good idea for you to worship me. And so he does destroy the false religion, goes in the temple and says, and blasphemes God and says, worship me. 
and this is going to be a whole worldwide system until it is finally destroyed and cast into the abyss. And that's what we are focusing and looking at today. So today we ask, what happens? What happens when everything that you are counting on collapses? What happens when everything you've worked for disappears overnight? What happens when all your savings are gone in one day? When all your equity is gone? When the broken, fragmented political system finally collapses? What then? Well, for some answers, let's turn to Revelation chapter 18 with verse 1. And today I want to look at five characteristics of commercial and geopolitical Babylon. Revelation 18, 1 says, After this, after this, after the total destruction of the false church by the beast, which we looked at last week, after this, I saw another angel coming down from heaven. He had great authority, and the earth was illuminated by his splendor. With a mighty voice he shouted, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. She has become a home for demons and a haunt for every evil spirit and a haunt for every unclean and detestable bird. Now, first of all, we see this very powerful angel. Now, I don't know where he is today. I don't know what he's doing now. I don't know what his work is right now. I presume he must be in God's presence because when he leaves there, he's kind of like Moses when Moses left the tabernacle. He is glowing. He's filled with glory. And his glory illuminates the entire earth. You're going to know. The world is going to know something is happening. Something is going on. And then we hear him proclaiming, Fallen, fallen is Babylon the great. Not just fallen, but fallen, fallen. He repeats himself because this is an event, a huge worldwide event. Babylon the Great is fallen. So first, the first characteristic, and I, I think I listed five. I say there's six, but there's five. So characteristic number one is that Babylon is demonic. The world system outside of God is demonic. The love of money is the root of all kinds of evil, evil representing demonic. Babylon in itself is demonic, and we see this demonstrated in several ways. A, she is a home for demons. He says, she has become a home for demons, right there. Can't say it any more clear than that. Now, as I shared earlier, money is not evil. Money is not evil. And I don't want you to think that at all. Money has no moral value. It is amoral. The problem arises within us when we covet it, when we worship it, when we think about it too much. And, and as a result of that, demons and demonic influence begin to work on us. It's, a, it's, a, it's an avenue or a door that we open and we subject ourselves to this demonic influence. Doesn't necessarily have to be Satan worship, but it can be money worship. And the result is not only the love of money and the love of things that it can buy and the good things in life, but it's even more than that. It even goes deeper than that. It affects our worship of God. The devil wants to receive that worship. I'm amazed at the place that the world plays in so many Christian lives. In fact, as I thought about that, and I thought about as we read through here, and we see some of the some of the luxuries that go along with this, I'm a, I was I was struck, I was struck, and I was struck recently by how important alcohol is for so many people. Now, I, I realized when I was not walking with the Lord and when I was out in the world, I mean, you, if you were going to go fishing, that meant that you needed a large boat, not for how many fish you were going to catch, but for all of the beer that you had to take along or for whatever picnic or for whatever you were doing. That, that was the first thing you had to have. As a matter of fact, I mean, in my later years, it's been so astonishing to me to see 
even at a funeral, even at a funeral, what kind of alcohol had to be present and the place that it had to play in individual lives. I have friends who actually get giddy as they're getting together thinking about the wine that they're going to be able to share, what, what wine they're going to bring and discussing it. And too much of that, not just that, that's just a little teeny sliver of the world, little little teeny sliver of, of, of this demonic influence and this demonic power that surrounds us as part of the world. But too much of that, too much love for that kind of thing, and soon Satan is there. That's part of the world. Be careful. Now, I hope you enjoy a glass of wine occasionally. I hope that whatever your, your drink is, I hope that you enjoy that. However, you, and, and I don't see anything in the Bible that says you can't do that. I was at, a number of years ago at Bible college, I had a classmate who said, anybody in America who, it's, it's a sin to drink alcohol. Well, I, I think that's stretching. I think that's stretching it an awfully lot. However, when you go from drinking a little to it having more influence and power, that's a huge problem. And when you go to the point to the point where that, that's what you, all, all that you want to do, or you become intoxicated, that's a problem every time. Intoxication is always a problem. And Scripture always condemns that. So too much of that, too much love for that, that kind of thing, too much love for the world, and Satan is there, and we're inviting him in. That is part of the world. It's part of the demonic influence. So be careful. B, Babylon is a haunt for every evil spirit. Babylon is a haunt for every evil spirit. I ask you to turn over to Ephesians chapter 2. Ephesians 2, 1 through 6. Paul writes to the church at Ephesus. He says, as for you, you were dead in your transgressions and sin, in which you used to live when you followed the ways of this world and of the ruler of the kingdom of the air, the spirit who is now at work in those who are disobedient. All of us also lived among them at one time, gratifying the cravings of our sinful nature and following its desires and thoughts. Like the rest, we were by nature objects of wrath. But because of this great love for because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace that you have been saved. We used to live, every Christian used to live in that world. We used to live under that influence. It is a haunt. The world is a haunt outside of your relationship with God. Outside your relationship with God is a haunt. The spirits are trying to attract you, trying to ensnare us, trying to cage us. In fact, see, it is a cage for every detestable, every detestable bird. Every detestable, disgusting, filthy, rotten, meat-eating bird. That's the picture we get. That's the picture of the world. I was talking with my wife this week, as we're, even my daughter, as we're looking at sending Nessa out into the world, going to kindergarten, or kindergarten next year. It's a hard thing to think about. She's been so sheltered and so protected. But the, 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 the hope and the truth of the matter is, is she's not of the world. She's not of the world. We're in the world, but we're not of the world. But the world is demonic. It's a haunt for every evil spirit and a cage for every detestable bird. And that sounds disgusting. And that sounds that might, you might think that that's exaggerating it, but it's understating it. It's understating the situation that we're facing. Number two. She is unfaithful. Revelation 18, 3. 
For all the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. The kings of the earth committed adultery with her. Well, we'll stop there. She is unfaithful. She is unfaithful because God is not in it. God is not in her. Whenever you love something or someone more than you love God, you've committed spiritual adultery. Whenever we put something in the place of God, we're committing spiritual adultery. And the whole world is doing it. And the nations, all the nations, verse 3, all the nations, even this one, even and maybe especially this one, when it comes to wealth and it comes to money and the abuse of that and the excesses of that, we have to look first at home. This is unfaithful. She is unfaithful. Number three, it is intoxicating. It is intoxicating. All the nations have drunk the maddening wine of her adulteries. They're getting drunk. They're, they're, they're buying into this, and they're not thinking clearly at all. They're drunk on the wine of her adulteries. They cannot resist her excessive luxuries. Who's taking all the fun out of this? I had a friend walk away from the church a number of years ago. Walk away from his family. He sat down with me across from my desk and he said, I have to do this for me. And he kind of pounded on his chest and, and said, right here in my heart, this is something I have to do. I have to walk away from the church. I have to walk away from my family. Because that's the draw and how addictive the world is. It is addictive. And I'm not just talking alcohol or sex or leisure or luxury or money. Visiting with someone this week about the story of when Jacob and Leah and Rachel fled from Laban's house. You can read the story in Genesis 31. I'm not going to turn there and I'm not going to have us turn there at this time. But the question goes, the question was put up, why did Rachel go back and steal Laban's gods? Why did the idols, why did, why did she go take those? And the thought was because of false doctrine. Because she didn't understand that that was wrong. That she wasn't supposed to bow down to another image. No, it was not because of false doctrine at all. Rachel was addicted. She needed the idols. They gave her peace and comfort. And she could not imagine life without them. This is intoxicating. Babylon is this intoxicating spirit all around us. And it tries to lure each one of us and capture each one of us. And that was pretty much point number three. To participate in the world is intoxicating. So what is the solution? What is the answer for this? Then I heard another voice from heaven say, Come out of her, my people, so that you will not share in her sins. So you will not receive any of her plagues. For her sins are piled up to heaven, and God has remembered her crimes. Give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. So the answer is come out. Come out. Get away from this stuff. God is forever calling his people out. The story of Lot over in Genesis is one of the early accounts of this kind of, of, this kind of thing. In Genesis chapter 19, verses 12 through 14. Two angels, or an angel and Jesus, had gone into the city of cities of Sodom and Gomorrah and said to Lot, you need to get out. Bad things are coming. You need to get out. That's what God is saying to us. You need to get out. Bad things are coming. And not just the final end and destruction, but if we continue down these paths, we're going to shipwreck our lives and shipwreck our faith. In Genesis 19, so two men say to Lot, do you have anyone else here? So they're trying to get Lot and all his family out. Sons, son-in-laws, sons, daughters, or anyone else in the city who belongs to you. Get them out of here. Get them out of here. Because we're going to destroy this place. The outcry to the Lord against his people is so great and he has sent us to destroy it. 
So Lot went out and spoke to his son-in-laws, who were pledged to marry his daughters, and he said, hurry and get out of this place, because the Lord is about to destroy the city. But his sons-in-law thought he was joking. With the coming of dawn, the angels urged Lot, saying, hurry, take your wife, your two daughters who are here, or you will be swept away when the city is punished. And when he hesitated, the men grabbed him by his hand and the hands of his wife and his two daughters and led them safely out of the city. And if you'll recall the story, they don't go very far before Lot's wife turns around to see her beloved city being destroyed and she's turned into a pillar of salt. God is saying there is destruction coming. Get out. Get out. Over in 1 John. 1 John chapter 2. 1 John chapter 2 verse 15 says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful men, the lust of his eyes, the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and its desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. The longer we hold on to the world, the harder it gets. It's unbelievable looking at the experience of Lot. He lost everything. He stayed too long. The truth is he never should have went there in the first place. He had, he had this is for me going on. He said, this is for me when he went to Sodom and Gomorrah. What he was looking at is, were dollar signs. If you look at, if you're in Genesis, go back a couple of chapters to Genesis chapter 13. Or write this down and look at it later. Genesis 13, 8 through 11. Now this is before, this is while he and Abraham were tending their herds side by side. Their servants were getting in fights with each other over water rights and over all kinds of things like this. And so, uh, so finally, Abraham, who is the senior, says to Lot, let's not have any quarreling between you and me or between your herdsmen and mine, for we are brothers. Is not the whole land before you? Let's part company. If you go to the left, I'll go to the right. If you go to the right, I'll go to the left. Lot looked up, and he saw the whole plain of the Jordan. He saw it was well watered, like the garden of the Lord, like the land of Egypt towards Zoar. This is before the Lord destroyed Sodom and Gomorrah. So Lot chose for himself. That's very telling right there. Lot chose for himself. I'm doing this for me. This is in my best interest, financially speaking. I got to do this for me. The love of money and luxury and even power. Lot gained power. He wound up being one of the main leaders. He sat at the gate and it cost him everything. God says, get out. You will reap what you sow. And there's a terrible judgment coming. God is sitting there. He wants to be merciful. He is being extremely merciful. He wants to forgive. He is extremely forgiving. He wants to be gracious. Come out now. It will be more difficult to give up the longer you wait. I often constantly remind myself, get over it quick. Don't hold on to the offenses and don't hold on to the things that hold on to us. Because you will constantly be brought back to this point. Don't think giving up the world or giving up any vice of the world or gossip or lusting or worrying. Don't think it'll be easier later. It won't. You'll be more attached and it will cost you more. Just like Lot. Babylon, number four, Babylon will be judged, will be judged on three criteria. Verse five, Revelation 18, her sins are piled up to heaven and God has remembered her crimes. A, remembrance. God is going to, at this point in time, he doesn't remember right now. He's not holding it against us right now. He's forgiving. He's trying to help you 
He's trying to help us come out. But he will remember someday. You push him off, you push him back, God will remember it. Number two, retribution. Verse six, give back to her as she has given. Pay her back double for what she has done. Makes her a double portion from her own cup. Babylon, because God has waited so patiently, is going to get double the payment. Double the judgment. We all, all want to know. We all want to look around at the world and look at all the bad that's going on and say, why does God allow that to go on? When is he going to judge that person who is trafficking in, in, in children, who is stealing children and putting them into slave traffic? When is God going to judge these things? He's going to do it when he gets around to it. Those sins right now are being piled up to heaven. He hasn't forgotten. Now, if you're under the grace of Jesus Christ, yeah, your sins are as far as the east is from the west. Yeah, don't, don't, don't mistake me for that. Don't, don't think I'm not saying that. If you're living outside that, or if you're trying to get away with something even now as a Christian, you, the day is coming. Sins are piled up to heaven. If you remember Babel, they were going to build a tower to heaven. Instead, their sins were heaped up. And because God has waited and waited and waited, they're going to pay back twice as much. And number three, C, excuse me, letter C is retaliation. Give her as much torture and grief, verse 7, as the glory and luxury she gave herself. In her heart she boasts, I said, as a queen, I am not a widow. I will never mourn. She's very secure. She doesn't, she's very confident. Nothing can touch her. Therefore, in one day, her plagues will overtake her. Death, mourning, and famine. She will be consumed by fire. For mighty is the Lord God who judges her. The world has mistreated and abused God's people from day one. And God has taken it. Now, I don't know how, if you abuse my child, you abuse my children, you may as well abuse me. I'm going to, I'm going to come out and, in defense of that and immediately. Well, God has taken it and he's allowed it because he's gracious and he's loving and he's wanting people to come to him. And that's what draws us to him. But there will be retaliation at some point in time. And when he acts, verse 9, when he does, when judgment comes, when the kings of the earth who committed adultery with her and shared her luxury see the smoke of her burning, they will weep and mourn over her. Terrified at her torment, they will stand far off and cry, Woe, woe, O great city, O Babylon, city of power. In one hour your doom has come. The merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her because no one buys their cargoes anymore. Cargoes of gold and silver and precious stones and pearls and fine linen and purple and silk and scarlet cloth and every sort of citron wood and articles of every kind made of ivory, costly wood, bronze, iron, and marble. Cargoes of cinnamon and spice, of incense and myrrh and frankincense, of wine and olive oil, of fine flour and wheat and cattle and sheep and horses and carriages and bodies and souls of men and souls of men. They will say the fruit you have longed for is gone from you. All your riches and splendor have vanished. And number five, her anguish will be unparalleled. The merchants who sold these things and gained their wealth from her will stand far off, terrified at the torment. They will weep and mourn and cry out, Woe, woe, great city dressed in fine linen, purple and scarlet and glittering with gold, precious stones and pearls. In one hour, such great wealth has been brought to ruin. Every sea captain and all who travel by ship, the sailors and all who earn their living from the sea will stand afar off. And when they see the smoke of her burning, they will exclaim, was there ever a city like this great city? They will throw dust on their heads, and with weeping and mourning they will cry out, Woe, woe, O great city, for all who had ships on the sea became rich through her wealth. In one hour she has been brought to ruin. And then we're turned back to heaven. Rejoice over her, O heaven. Rejoice, saints and apostles and prophets. God has judged her for the way she treated you. And then a mighty angel picked up a boulder the size of a large millstone, thrown it into the sea, and said, With such violence, the great city of Babylon will be thrown down, never to be found again. The music of harps and musicians and flute 
players and trumpeters will never be heard in you again. No workman of any trade will ever be found in you again. The sound of a millstone will never be heard in you again. The light of a lamp will never shine in you again. The voice of bridegroom and bride will never be heard in you again. Your merchants were the world's great men. By your magic spell, all the nations, all the nations were led astray. In her was found the blood of the prophets and the saints and of all who have been killed on the earth. The world has mistreated and abused God's people, and judgment is coming. And the anguish will be unparalleled. Kings will feel it. All the merchants of the world, all the, all the sea merchants. And, and it's interesting, the kings will weep and mourn. The merchants will weep and mourn. The sea merchants will weep and mourn. Now, what city are we talking about, or what exactly are we talking about here? Is this a rebuilt Babylon by the Euphrates? Certainly is the spirit of Babylon. Is it Rome? I think it's clear that the false religious leader will be in Rome. Will it be New York? Will it be Wall Street? The truth is, the truth is it will be all of them. It will be all of them. If you go back to Revelation 16, 17, and especially verse 20, I won't take you there necessarily, but it talks about this great earthquake that's going to occur right about this time. A great earthquake that all the cities of the world will be brought down. Not only that, all the mountains will be gone. And the islands will sink. Now, I love the mountains. And as I thought about this, I come back here and I go out and I look for the Rocky Mountains. They're not going to be there. They're going to be gone. There's this, this, this so catastrophic. So catastrophic. It will affect the entire shape of the surface of the earth. And people will sit back and they'll see the fire coming from that city and the fire coming from that city and the smoke coming from that one. Get out. Get out while the getting is good. It's so easy to get sucked into it. I remember many years ago living in Payette. Had dreams of building houses and lumberyard and ranching and, and just business and just making money. It's been interesting doing this house that I've been working on. It's nearly finished. And when it's done, I'll have no regrets walking away from it. Walk out of Babylon while you can. I'll tell you what. I remember, I remember, I remember when God spoke to me and said, Hey, the houses and the construction and that, that's not what I have for you. I want, I want you to do something else. I want you to be a preacher. I cried. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to do that. I didn't want to leave. I didn't want to leave. Just like Lot didn't want to leave Sodom and Gomorrah. Just like you don't want to leave whatever's holding you there. Whatever's drawing you. Whatever the world, whatever affected and appeal it has to you. But never made a better decision in my life. What is he asking you to give up? Is it a habit? Is it an addiction? Is it an attitude? Is it a thought? Is it anger? Is it pride? Is it lust? Do you love the world and the things of the world a little too much? God is asking us to take a look and to come out. Come out. Because it isn't going to last. It can't. Let's pray. Father, I, I have to hearken back to the, to the worship songs that led us to this point. And just to, just to stop and think about what an amazing, incredible God you are. And how much we need you and how much we need a Savior. Even for the little things in life, not just this destruction of Babylon at the very end of the age. But the destruction of sin any place in our hearts and in our lives, even right now. We need you for that. We can't even, we are like Rachel. We can't even put the idols down. We can't even put them back. We're clinging to things that are not worthy our attention. Forgive us, Father. Speak truth to our hearts. 
Help our hearts to be open to hear it. Make the changes that we need to before we find ourselves in a situation like Lot and so many others. Father, we thank you for your mercy and your grace and your forgiveness, your patience with us. And we do love you in Jesus' name. Amen. As Pastor Phil 